Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the uniqueness proof for the continuous ultimatum game. It's something that I cover in Chapter 3 of Game Theory 101 Bargaining. You can find out more information about that in the video description. This is actually one of those more technical lectures, so if you are uninterested in the formal modeling aspects of bargaining, you can safely skip this lecture. Just note that what we covered in the previous lecture, the optimal strategies that I showed exist for the continuous ultimatum game, know that those are the only optimal strategies that exist in this game. There are no other optimal strategies. What I'm going to be doing in this lecture is actually going through the proof that verifies that there are no other optimal strategies. So remember back from last time that the optimal strategies that we found, the mutually optimal strategies where one player can't do anything better given what the other person is doing, is as follows. Albert demands everything for himself. He offers x equal to zero for Barbara, and Barbara is indifferent when she's offered that amount and accepts with certainty. And remember, this is very good for Albert and very bad for Barbara. But there's the remaining question of, are there any other strategies that have this mutually optimal uh, quality about them? And the answer is no. We know this because there is no other strategy involving an amount being offered greater than zero. We saw that last time, where if Albert were to be offering some positive amount to Barbara, he could always have that offer, give her a little bit less, and still ensure her compliance because she's receiving a strictly positive amount and therefore has to accept. The remaining possibility is what happens if Barbara rejects with positive probability when she's offered nothing. Remember again that when Barbara is offered nothing, she is indifferent between accepting and rejecting. Previously, we looked at what happens when she accepts with certainty, but of course, it's still possible she might be able to and she might want to reject with positive probability. But what we're going to see here is given that she rejects with positive probability, there is no other optimal strategy. So to answer the question firmly again, there are no other optimal strategies than what we covered previously. And the proof is as follows. So suppose that if Albert offers Barbara nothing, he demands everything for himself, that Barbara accepts not with certainty, but rather with probability p. So p could be a value equal to zero or any fraction up all the way to one, but not equal to one. We already covered the situation where p was equal to one. Under these circumstances, Albert's payoff is one minus x times p. That's the offer that he's giving, uh, the remainder of the offer he's giving to Barbara. So remember, x is the amount that Barbara gets, so 1 minus x is the amount that Albert keeps to himself, times probability p, which is the probability that Barbara accepts. But remember here, x is equal to 0. Albert is demanding everything for himself. So 1 minus x times p simplifies very quickly to just p exactly. So Albert's payoff, if he demands everything, leaves Barbara nothing, and Barbara accepts with probability p, is equal to p. That's what Albert receives, p. All right, well now we need to ask ourselves retrospectively, if Albert's expected payoff for demanding everything is equal to p, would he actually want to demand everything? Is offering x equal to zero optimal at this point? And the answer is no. Why is that the case? Well, imagine that instead of demanding everything and leaving Barbara with nothing, he offered Barbara some positive amount equal to 1 minus p divided by 2. Remember, p is a number that is not as big as 1. It is strictly less than 1. So if Albert offers Barbara this amount, 1 minus p divided by 2, that is a strictly positive amount. Which, mean Bar which means Barbara receives a strictly positive amount by accepting, which is more than, she re uh, more than she receives if she rejects. She receives nothing if she rejects. So Barbara must accept under those circumstances. And in that case, if Barbara is accepting with certainty, then Albert receives the remainder, which is 1 minus the offer size, which is 1 minus p divided by 2. And if you do a little bit of algebraic manipulation on your own, you will see that 1 minus 1 minus p divided by 2 is strictly greater than p. So that means that if Barbara were to be rejecting with positive probability and is no longer accepting with certainty when Albert offers her nothing, there is no optimal offer for Albert under those circumstances. And we can see this visually. So this proof might be a little bit hard to grasp, but if you think about this visually, the intuition becomes clear. If Albert demands everything, 
And everything here is a value between 0 and 1. So, well, if we're looking at a bargaining value between 0 and 1, Albert is demanding the entire line that fills up your screen, not just the blue part, but including the white part at the end as well. If Albert demands everything and leaves nothing for Barbara, then Albert's expected payoff is just the blue portion of the line. And the reason is that he's not receiving everything in expectation because now Barbara is rejecting with positive probability. He's only receiving an amount up to P. So he only receives that blue amount. There is no amount that Barbara receives under these circumstances because he's, she's not being offered anything and she's rejecting some of the time. So there's no way she's actually getting anything for herself. That remainder on the right, that white portion on the right, is an amount that's completely lost in the bargaining process. This is what's called deadweight loss, sometimes referred to in economics as deadweight loss. This is an amount that no one is benefiting from even though both parties would be better served if they could somehow figure out a way to split that. And certainly no one would be worse off if they figured out a way to split that. So given that you're in this circumstance, if you were Albert and you're expecting that you will only receive a value of P if you demand everything, well, a better situation for you to do or a better choice for you to make is instead of demanding everything, to demand up to that white line, that second white line that I just drew in, that second vertical white line that I just drew in. If you offer... Uh, some amount to Barbara, the amount to the right of that, and you demand the remainder to yourself. Well, now again, Barbara is being offered a strictly positive amount, so she has to accept. And now you're getting the rest with certainty. And the rest with certainty is now much larger than it was when you were demanding everything for yourself, leaving nothing for Barbara, and only receiving P. Now you're receiving the value of P, and you're getting a little bit more as well. So given that Barbara is accept, or rather is uh, not accepting with certainty and is only accepting with probability P under these circumstances, you could do better by not demanding everything. But of course, we know from before that if you are demanding or if you're offering Barbara some positive amount, you could always do better by shrinking that amount. So again, we end up in the situation where Barbara can't actually obtain anything because Albert would always be chopping down this offer to smaller and smaller and smaller bits. So the conclusion that we draw here is that the continuous ultimatum game has what we call in game theory a unique sub-game perfect equilibrium. If you don't know what that is, well, you can go watch the game theory course and, and learn about that on your own. But the, the gist of it is that there are a singular set of optimal strategies, and it's the set of optimal strategies that we covered in the last lecture, where Albert demands everything for himself and Barbara always accepts those demands. Now, because we have this singular, unique result, from now on, we are going to assume that players will always accept when indifferent. We won't spend, you know, another 10 minutes every single time trying to figure out what happens if a player rejects with po positive probability when he or she is indifferent between accepting or rejecting. And that's because the logic that I presented here always follows through. If there's some deadweight loss caused by someone rejecting an offer, you could retroactively think about going back and offering this slight sliver to the other person to ensure their compliance and make sure that you get more out of the bargain that way. So we're going to be assuming now always every single time that players accept when indifferent. And if you're reading academic literature on bargaining games like this, you will often see that these, these scholars will do the same exact thing. They will assume that players accept when indifferent for, again, these exact same reasons. It's a well-known fact among bargaining theorists that in these continuous ultimatum games uh, that you have a unique equilibrium solution, which is, again, for the guy who's making the offer to demand everything and for the other person to accept that with certainty. So just to be clear, one last time, these are the unique strategies, the strategies that I just said just a second ago and the strategies that I fully covered in the last lecture. Those are the unique solution, or that is the unique solution to a continuous ultimatum game. So again, going forward, we are not going to be going through all of these possibilities. We are just going to assume that players accept when indifferent. All right, that wraps up this lecture, and in the next lecture, we can start figuring out what happens when we see counteroffers being made between the players. Hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.